the uh, China relationship. Now, you've been tasked with one of the more difficult things in, in government, the, the effort to try and reopen the lines of communication, which your predecessor was unable to with your counterpart. Is there any hope of you achieving that? Oh, look, it, it, you know, it's, it's a challenge. We, we haven't had a formal trade minister's meeting uh, with China now for well over three years, but we have a, a new commerce minister now who's just been appointed in China, was appointed around the same time that I was, and I've written to the Chinese commerce minister saying that we'd like to constructively engage and, look, I'll wait and see. And, as I've said, what we want to do is be proactive, principled and patient. So I'll be patient and wait to see whether we get a, get a reply. Because I Can think you give us an insight into what you said in the letter? Look, look, I won't go into detail out of respect for the new um, Chinese commerce minister, but th there are many ways that we can constructively engage across the trade and investment uh, liberalisation path. So that's, that's what I would like to see, but I won't go into the specific details. Not an easy letter. drafting exercise, though, to put that letter together, given where the relationship is at. Did you reach out to anyone in terms of doing that? Because obviously it's a, a, a piece of correspondence of great significance when we can't even get a phone call. Yesterday, the New Zealand government signed a, an expanded free trade agree agreement with that very individual you're talking about, the Chinese Commerce Minister. Yeah, look, I, um, I over the Christmas New Year period, I probably didn't have the vacation that I thought I might have been, so I've been speaking to uh, previous Australian trade ministers. You know, we've got a great record when it comes to trade and investment liberalisation. So I've spoken to Andrew Robb, I've spoken to Mark Bale, I've spoken to former heads of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, like uh, Peter Varghese, a, a Depth Secretary in Trade, but someone who I respect um, greatly, Peter Gray and other people. So I've spoken to a lot of people to seek advice, not just on how we uh, deal with China, but also with the UK and the EU, because they're very important that we get free trade agreements with mm. them. The India relationship, which is incredibly important to us, and I really like to prioritise that. It's something we're going to have to be patient about, but there is no reason why we, sh you know, that patience shouldn't also have a great level of proactivity to it. So there's, I've had numerous uh, conversations. Obviously, how we uh, re-engage or engage with the Biden administration mm. is going to be critical as well. So there's there's a lot for us to do. Vietnam, uh, you know, is a, a, a real opportunity for us to build on the, the great inroads we've been able to make there. So there's there's a lot of opportunities. Japan, yeah. you know, another key ally, another key trading partner. There's there's a hell of a lot for us to do. So there are opportunities there, a absolutely. but there are also huge challenges. If you look at the China situation. As I said earlier, New Zealand's just signed that expanded FTA. The US still has large amounts of Chinese investment. The EU secured market access for their companies in, in China and vice versa. Are we out of step with other Western nations? And if so, can we be pragmatic enough to get it back online? Well, if you, if you look at um, our relationship with China, especially on the trade and investment front, you know, we're ahead of most countries because we put the uh, free trade agreement, we've got the free trade agreement, which we negotiated un under a coalition government, and it's a, a, a very good free trade agreement. And, you know, our, our challenge now is to make sure that, you know, we use that free trade agreement that we've got with China con to continue um, to grow uh, the economic relationship in a very constructive way, and that's that's what I will be seeking to do. It's, it's basically, I guess, just trying to get the face-to-face -face conversation, but you you look at President Xi, uh, his speech to Davos, the economic forum, he, he warned about building circles or starting a new Cold War to threaten or intimidate others. Did you see a bit of irony in those comments? Well, he, he also spoke about the importance of... of trade uh, liberalisation and investment liberalisation. And I think what we've got to do is, is look at the positives from messages like that. We obviously, you know, our whole trade policy is based on trade and investment liberalisation. So what we've got to do is make sure that we can have that constructive dialogue so that we can practise, you know, what we, what we preach, because that's what we want to be doing in Australia. I'm sure that that's what President Xi is seeking to do from a Chinese perspective. So let's be constructive in making sure that if we you know, are really pushing for trade and investment liberalisation. That's that's what we're practising. You're the tourism minister as well now, as, as well as trade and investment. Um, you're considering some targeted financial assistance to the tourism industry because international travel, obviously, unlikely anytime soon. 
Uh, our indication has been that JobKeeper won't be extended for any sector, including tourism. Can you confirm that uh, assistance will be in any in another form? Well, obviously the government is, is going through the decision-making process around JobKeeper at the moment, and I, I won't make um, you know final decisions for the, for the Treasurer, but all everything that the Treasurer has said and the Prime Minister has said has been very consistent that JobKeeper will end uh, at the end of March. So what we then have to look at and see, OK, do, is there the analysis there because there is the potential that we might be able to put in place some sort of target, targeted policies or, or targeted assistance for those sectors that are still being impacted by, by the pandemic. So that's one of the things that I've been having discussions with the tourism industry about is, you know, and there, there's the other issue that we've got to deal with. The domestic tourism has held up pretty strongly in most parts of Australia throughout the pandemic, so it's only those parts of the tourism sector that have really been impacted by the international, international. tourism. So, but do, you, do you reassure those people, the mum and dad companies, say in Cairns and, uh, and other cities where it's not Qantas, it's not a big tourism company, but you won't be just providing financial assistance to the Qantases of the world? You, you will remember those mum and dad companies too? Oh, look, in all the engagements that I've had, it's been not only about big companies but small companies as well because especially as someone who comes from regional and rural Australia, you know, it's those mums and dads, tourism businesses that we've also got to make sure that we're looking after. So I've been having a lot of dialogue uh, over the last three or four weeks when it comes to the tourism sector. Uh, a, to understand the issues that they're dealing with and, and B, to say to them, you know, what do you think is needed to try and help and support you while we wait for the vaccine uh, to be rolled out, while we wait for international travel to, to kick-start again, which hopefully might be in forms of bubbles sometime this year. You, you would think highly unlikely that we're going to see mass international tourism back to, until next year, um, I, I would think, at the earliest. So absolutely having those conversations and we'll continue to have them. Well, uh, as Trade, Investment and Tourism Minister Dan Tien, you've got a huge... Job ahead of you. We wish you all the best in some of those. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kieran. Great to be with you.